uh, within my own traditional territory. So on a typical West Coast day, it's uh, equally uh, pleasurable, as I would say, as a West Coaster. Maybe not so much for others, but uh, anyways. I also wanted to recognize the federal attendees that are with us, as well as the First Nations Summit and uh, BC government attendee as well. So thank you for joining us and the media who happens to be here today. I need to give a special recognition to my staff who make my job incredibly uh, easy. Um, it's their dedication, commitment, and hard work that makes us a strong, cohesive um, team. We challenge each other, and I think we challenge each other in a great way. So again, I need to recognize the staff that are here today and those that are at the office uh, keeping down the fort for us. So this year, um, I have a number of items to report on and present on. Again, the Commission continues to advocate that there is no greater expression of reconciliation than a modern treaty fairly negotiated and honorably implemented. Mm. The Treaty Commission emphasizes this in all its facets of our work. We have a process in British Columbia that results in constitutionally entrenched reconciliation. I would say that's the most unique process that we have in British Columbia, in Canada, as well as in the world. And something that we're deeply proud of at the Treaty Commission, and it's something that all British Columbians and Canadians should be proud of, a process that it gets us to constitutionally entrenched reconciliation. And again, we have a number of items to be proud of. For instance, Tlaiaman Treaty came into effect this year. I think that's a great celebration of the process of reconciliation in British Columbia, a process that is working, a process that is getting all parties to reconciliation. Again, um, coming into effect April 5th. I want to emphasize when a treaty becomes effective, a nation is able to move beyond the Indian Act, become self-determining, truly setting their own priorities forward based on their vision, their values, cultures, and priorities. And this must be celebrated here in British Columbia. Ensuring that a nation gets to their path to self-determination uh, is extremely important. And I won't talk anymore. I'm going to turn to Jerry later on. Uh, in this presentation, recognizing that Jerry has been with the Commission for nine years and has been at the Tlaiaman Treaty Table, Treaty Negotiations. Another development, the United Nations Declaration. For the first time in Canada's history, the federal government is making reconciliation a priority. This must be undertaken across the entire government, and we see this demonstrated in the mandate letters that have come down from the Prime Minister himself. Official endorsement of, without qualification, of the United De Nations Declaration in May is another significant milestone and a step towards reconciliation. Treaties help enable Canada fulfill its obligations under UNDRIP. It breathes life into negotiations by encouraging new approaches when efforts towards reconciliation stall or stumble. Key principles of UNDRIP are consistent with the 1991 Task Force Report the blueprint for treaty negotiations and the establishment of the Treaty Commission and the process that we are proud of here in British Columbia. We have an established process, one that leads to constitutionally entrenched reconciliation. Self-determination is a core principle of the United Nations Declaration. It's a core principle and goal of treaty negotiations, is a founding principle of the BC Treaty Negotiation Process and the Commission. The connections between UNDRIP the benefit of modern treaties and the BC treaty negotiations process is vital to the dialogue on reconciliation in Canada. Recognizing the potential of negotiations will focus the commitment required by all parties to making progress to completing treaties in British Columbia. And at the end of the day, it's about ensuring that there is a new relationship created based on mutual respect and understanding and First Nations find their rightful place in Canadian society. And by that, First Nations are not confined to the colonial past, but can break free and carve out their future in partnership with British Columbia and Canada. So in our annual report, we did a series of Voices of Reconciliation. I encourage everyone to read these interviews. We were able to gather leaders, seven leaders we interviewed, that have deep insights regarding reconciliation, deep insights to treaty negotiations, also have unique perspectives regarding reconciliation from their lived experiences. And of course, we often do not hear from these esteemed leaders because they're at home doing the busy work 
of nation building, rebuilding, and implementing within their communities. They're building their nations to provide a better, brighter future for all the generations to come. So we had interviews with Pegus Clint Williams, President Mitchell Stevens and Kevin McKay from the Niska Nation, Chief Bryce Williams and Tom McCarthy from Sawasan, Chief Ann Mack from Toquat Nation, John Jack from Huey at First Nations, as well as Grand Chief Edward John as the United Nations Permanent Forum expert member and one of the long-standing First Nations Summit Task Force members. Some of the key principles that come from the interviews are around self-determination. For instance, Hey Goose, Clint Williams talks about a whole new set of tools being created for them to advance reconciliation. There's cash, there's an economic component, and as Hegu states, never had any of these resources available to us before self-government, before treaty. Huayat John Jack talks about how the treaty provided tools to go in almost any direction, allows leaders to improve over what came before and what is now our failures, his words, our own, but our successes are also our own. So important to ensure that nations will sometimes make mistakes, but those are theirs to make, and we need to support them in ensuring that they get to a better place through reconciliation, through treaty negotiations. Chief Ann Mack talks about the governance system, how they're able to keep their traditional systems intact, having hereditary leadership provide guidance, stewardship, as well as their elected councillors alongside, ensuring that they govern the Tolkwat Nation together in unison, ensuring, again, they have a better outcome for their next generations to come. And they're a huge economic player within their region. That's to be celebrated. Culture, another extremely important facet of not only United Nations Declaration, but with treaty negotiations in itself. You have the ability to revive culture, the ability for cultural resurgence, ensuring that cultural elements are involved in new developments, providing work for artists. That's Chief Bryce Williams. Reconciliation, a founding key principle of the United Nations Declaration, as well as treaty negotiations here in British Columbia. For instance, Hue at John Jack talks about the treaty is the number one step in allowing us to achieve reconciliation even after the historical baggage. First Nations and treaty have the best chances amongst First Nations to achieve what they aspire to. And the Nishka Nation, President Mitchell Stevens and Kevin McKay talk about reconciliation through their nation vision, through one heart, one path, one nation. The Nishka people are not separate from this country. They are part of this country. And his interview, those interviews, will talk about that. They touch on how they have taken the brave step to negotiate themselves into Canada, even after 150 years of colonialism, after the Niska lobby to the Privy Council, as well as the esteemed Calder case. And now they're imp implementing a constitutionally entrenched treaty that is one of the many benefits of treaty. That's what they see. That's their vision. Free prior and informed consent, another underlying tenant of the United Nations Declaration, as well as treaty negotiations in British Columbia. One of the fundamental principles to be discussed by Grand Chief Edward John is about veto. And he answers the question about veto in our interview. If it means veto if necessary, but veto assumes that there's an inferior position. FPIC means on equal position with equal government is underscored by decision making. So being a part of the decision making process is integral to ensuring that our culture, survival and dignity moves on to the future and that is brought to you through treaty negotiations. Those nations are all implementing treaty negotiations right for one of the main reasons because you get a seat at the table. You get a say when it comes to how the development of your territory will be undertaken. You get a voice in the decision making. And as President Mitchell Stevens and Kevin McKay state in their interviews, the Niska have been able to protect their lands and resources through their environmental chapter. Nothing happens in their traditional territory without consultation and without agreement. That is powerful. And this is to ensuring that First Nations are free from the Indian Act, free to set their paths forward to reach their goal of reconciliation and independence. And referring to what John Jack had said, their failures are their own, but their successes are equally their own. 
Also included on our annual report is our submission to the UN, the UN uh, when we attended in May. And uh, it was actually quite an exciting time to see the declaration uh, be endorsed by Canada. But our main role was to highlight treaty negotiations and the potential that treaty negotiations have for reconciliation. To demonstrate that the, the treaty negotiations process here in British Columbia works. We have constitutionally entrenched reconciliation in Canada. We also emphasize the shared goals of the treaty negotiation process and how UNDRIP fits within that and how they empower each other. Because the BC treaty process is vital to the dialogue on reconciliation in Canada. So we submitted recommendations. Um, they also made the final report uh, made to the UN. So we're quite excited and very proud uh, about our recommendations make it into the final report. And again, our uh, summary is on page 17. Closing the gap. So that's page 20. This is about the Deloitte report. Um, that will be available on our website by the end of day today. And I you know, talked about this last year, however, I think it's extremely important to highlight that we're able to release the report this year. We a undertook a multi-year uh, process with Deloitte looking at the socioeconomic benefits of modern treaties. Validates the findings of previous studies of significant future economic benefits from treaties to First Nations. It is estimated in our Deloitte report the economic benefits range between 1.2 and $5.8 billion in our province to grow our economy. That is what is achievable through treaty negotiations in British Columbia. That's what's achievable in Canada through reconciliation, through the treaty process. The report begins to examine a broader socioeconomic benefits that come from self-determination and self-government. But the really important point is treaties create a multiplier effect, meaning that all British Columbians and all Canadians benefit from settling treaties. And this closes the gap between First Nations and non-First Nations peoples, especially so we can strive to change the socioeconomic conditions for Indigenous peoples while continuing to grow our economy in British Columbia. When a First Nation prospers, the whole region prospers. And a great example of reconciliation in, in action is the Sawasan Malls. Investment in local economy has been significant. They've attracted over one billion in private sector investment, 750 million in commercial development, and 200 million in industrial. The remainder is uh, residential, and this was achieved because of their treaty. This enables economic freedom and financial independence for Sawasan. Nishka Nation talks about how their treaty provides political and financial independence. And I think that is the goal for a lot of First Nations that are in the treaty negotiations process, is to get that freedom, to become economically independent, to be self-sustaining, self-determining nations. And we have the opportunity to make significant progress in British Columbia when it comes to treaty negotiations over the next couple of years. We estimate 11 treaties can be completed over the next two years. This is significant for reconciliation in the province of British Columbia and for national reconciliation in Canada. I think that's significant. I just wanted to briefly take us through our updated map on page 23, which is one of my favorite features, although the whole annual report is my favorite, but uh, the updated map I think is important because that gives us a view of progress that has been made, but equally important where we are going to be making significant progress. Two First Nations that were recently added to the map are Gwasalanokwadok and Katsi. Tlaiamen has moved to implement it. And the First Nations highlighted in the map represent 37 Indian Act bands, or 18.5% of all Indian, back, Indian Act bands in British Columbia. The territories represented in the state of intent in these First Nations cover approximately a third of British Columbia. Some of the statistics are 65 for Na First Nations, 105, Current and former Indian Act bands out of 200 are participating in or have completed treaties in British Columbia. Through our process, that's 52.5% remain involved either through implementation or through direct treaty negotiations in British Columbia. Active or completed negotiations involve 40 First Nations representing 76 Indian Act bands. 
in BC and one in the Northwest Territories. This means 38% of all BC Indian Act bans are actively negotiated. There are seven First Nations currently implementing. We have the five Monuth First Nations, Tlaiaman, Swasin, and Niska that was concluded pr just prior to the BC Treaty negotiations process launching here in BC. With other implemented modern treaties, the total increases to eight. The Niska final agreement, again, was un being negotiated as our process was unfolding. We have Yale that is ratified, yet not implemented. So a land and cash offer has also been tabled at the Tanaha and Guasal and Aqueduct. So there's significant progress being made in British Columbia when it comes to treaty negotiations. And we're on the cusp of completing several more uh, over the next couple of years. And I think that is astounding for our economy here in British Columbia. Negotiations in the multilateral engagement report that's available within our process. So that is a report undertaken by the principals, overview of our role and the proposed in the action items for the Treaty Commission, of course, includes an enhanced role in supporting stage five tables, where the commission will be involved in assisting the parties to set timeframes and tripartite multi-year multi strategies. Also assisting in exploratory tables, so looking at stepping stone approaches, condensed AIPs, sectoral arrangements, core treaties. So the Treaty Commission may be asked to facilitate or assist the parties in the exploratory table process, but these processes are already envisioned under the task force report, as well as consistent with the principles in the United Nations Declaration. It captures treaties, agreements, and other constructive agreements. The Treaty Commission has always advocated for interim measures and steps to be taken to get closer to treaty as a fundamental part of the BC Treaty negotiation process. We will continue to support the parties in their exploratory processes and supporting them to get to a place where they have new relationships based on mutual respect and understanding. And so with that, one last item. We have launched our new website today. So we're quite proud that we have a new website. I encourage everyone to check out our new website that went live last night. Um, all our resources are available. The annual report will be on there. The Deloitte report will be available at the end of business day today, as well as other resources that I think is fundamental when we're sharing our expertise, our knowledge, and our goal of completing treaties in British Columbia. So with that, thank you. I will now turn to Tom to make some remarks. And then Jerry. Thank you, Celeste. Good morning, everyone. Um, just to follow on some of the remarks that uh, Celeste has made, I'm going to talk about my nation, the Huayat First Nations, and, and where we've come. I'm going to start with the Indian Act. Uh, in 2009, you may recall there was that huge storm that blew down trees in Stanley Park. Well, we have a campground right on Pachina Beach, and there were some nice merchantable timber that also came down in the storm. We, we wanted to move those timbers out of the campground to get ready for camping season and move them about 400 meters to our playing field in the middle of our village. It took us seven months to get permission from the minister in Ottawa just to move those trees. Seven months to get permission. And then we wanted to sell them because they were merchantable and we had to get permission to sell them. We sold them. The money didn't come to us. It went into our trust account in Ottawa where we got to beg through proposals to access it. Not anymore. So we are five years into implementation we are the, the largest landowners now in the Bamfield region. We just purchased 55 hectares of land within Bamfield Inlet. We have fishing licenses that, we, uh, that provide economic benefit. We have the Me Too clause for the Neutrano Fisheries case in our treaty. We own now a fishing charter resort in Bamfield. We have our forestry business. We have our campground business. We recently purchased the store, the market in Bamfield, and the restaurant, and the pub, and the motel. And so we're, we're, you, you can't do these things under the Indian Act. It is impossible. So our lives now are flourishing. Our, our, our economic uh, um, region is starting to get back on its feet. And uh, I can say that the people of Bamfield, the Bamfield community, are really pleased to see the Huayat Nations come 
and to purchase these businesses and to bring them up to standard and to run them like a business. So we're doing really, really well. We also uh, got a seat on the Alberni Clackwood Regional District. Uh, you heard the name John Jack. He's from my community. He sits on the board as our representative. We have four tribes within the Barclay Sound that are party to the Monmouth Final Agreement, and they all have a seat on the regional Alberni region, Clackwood Regional District. So we have a four-vote voice now in, in local government, and uh, that's important. We're now able to uh, bring forward um, ideas for, for the regional district to undertake projects within our territory now, and, uh, and so that, that's, as, that's important. So on April 1st, 2011, our treaty came into effect. We wove ourselves into the fabric of Canada and British Columbia, and I am a proud Huayat member and a, and a proud Canadian. So I also wanted to just share, we have our citizenship cards now. Uh, on the front, it uh, has your name, uh, your traditional name, uh, the Longhouse, because each person that is enrolled, get the hereditary chiefs come together and we place that person into their respective longhouse, the traditional house, the traditional governance house. And on the back we have an oath that every member has to take uh, to uphold our constitution and uphold our laws and to be a good contributing citizen. So I just wanted to share that with you because we, <laughs> you know, under the Indian Act you manage poverty. And, uh, and that's all you can do. You, you, you can't make a life a better future for your children. And uh, in our case, the Five Nations Party to the Monmouth Final Agreement now have the ability and the tools to, uh, to, to really uh, change the circumstances of our communities. And most importantly, where are people who live away from home, we are now able to provide services and things to them as well. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, on April 5th, 2016, at midnight, the Kliaman Treaty came into effect. Uh, I had worked at the Kliaman table all my time with, with the Treaty Commission, so about nine years, and uh, I was able to attend this amazing gathering of the community uh, on, that, uh, on that evening. Um, one of the highlights... Uh, no offense here to my federal friends, one, one of the highlights was the burning of the Indian Act, where members of uh, the Klamen Nation uh, took parts of the Indian Act and threw it on this huge bonfire. Uh, at the risk of losing my position with the Treaty Commission, I too uh, contributed to that, uh, that effort. Um, the burning of the Indian Act was uh, followed by the first gathering of uh, the new legislature for the uh, Klamen, First, uh, Klamen Nation. And they enacted over 40 laws and um, other related um, necessary uh, pieces of legislation to bring into effect uh, their, their treaty. Um, I wanted to point out that Klamen is now the largest fee simple landowner in the Powell River area. and. Um, Klamen has worked very closely with the city of Powell River, River and the regional district for many years now. They've built up a, an amazing relationship. Um, uh, it, it, it may be considered a small item by some, but uh, if you go to the, the uh, town hall, city hall of Powell River, and you look outside, you'll see the Powell River, the, B, the BC flag, the uh, Canada's flag, the Powell River flag, and the Klamen Nation flag. Um, and um, you don't often see that around the province as you travel. That relationship has really become a model of, of relationship between a First Nation and municipalities. And indeed, uh, you'll probably be able to access it through our, our brand new website. We do have a publication specifically on the Powell River experience that we often share with members of uh, Union of uh, BC Municipalities. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bestseller. Um, on Saturday, April 9th, a few days after this, uh, this particular uh, event, there was a celebration ceremony, and it was just a wonderful gathering of uh, the community, 
uh, people from the surrounding area, uh, people from outside to, uh, to really uh, take advantage of the fact that this was a, a historic occasion. Um, at the time, uh, six poles were uh, unveiled that had been carved in front of the, the Klyaman government house. And I, I'm pleased to say that in our annual report this year, all of the photos are taken uh, from the Klyaman uh, uh, government house and the area surrounding the house. And uh, we want to thank Klyaman for allowing us to, to do this. Minister Bennett and uh, Provincial Minister Rustad attended and both spoke, and I, I just wanted to, to mention one quote from Minister Bennett. She said, and I quote, this treaty benefits all Canadians and has set us on a path towards true reconciliation and a renewed relationship with Klyaman based on recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership, and, end of quote. Uh, and that was the whole tone throughout the, uh, the celebration that, that took place on April the 9th. Uh, I'd invite you to, once again, go to our new website because there is a, uh, a connection to our YouTube channel. And on the YouTube channel, there are several of the presentations that took place on April 9th, if you'd like to, to, uh, to view them. I did want to uh, also share one quote from a young person who attended uh, this celebration. His name is Drew Blaney and he's a Klyaman nation citizen. And he stated, when the statement of intent for our treaty was put in place back in December 1993, I was 22 days old. Today, when our treaty is being implemented, I am 22 years old. It's a great achievement for our nation, and over that time, I have seen a lot of great effort from a lot of our leaders, a lot of our leaders, and I've seen a lot of progress, end of quote. Uh, that kind of expresses the kind of emotion that there was present on the day of celebration, and it carries on now as they begin to implement their treaty. Um, Mark Smith and I visited their new government house, which is fully operational now just uh, about four weeks ago. It's a marvelous facility. If you're in the Powell River area, I urge you to drop in. I'm sure they'll be glad to give you a tour. Um, and uh, once again, they had a, their first formal election for their legislature, and uh, Clint Williams was re-elected as Hegus, which, which is uh, the equivalent, I guess, of chief, but a little bit more than chief. So Hegus Clint Williams continues uh, to lead uh, as uh, they move into a, a bright and prosperous future. Thank you. So that concludes our presentation, and if there's any questions, we're open to questions at this time. And again, thanks for everyone coming. <laughs> Check out the website. <laughs> yes, please go to our new website. Fabulous. Thanks. Thank you.